I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Zoback, who's the Benjamin Page Professor of Geophysics at Stanford University. He conducts research on in situ stresses, fault mechanics, and reservoir geomechanics. He was one of the principal investigators of the San Andres Fault Ob Observatory at Depth Project, which is a scientific research well was successfully drilled through the San Andres Fault uh, at seismogenic depth. He is the author of a textbook entitled Reservoir Geomechanics that was published in 2007 by Cambridge University Press. He's the author or co-author of over 300 technical papers, holder of five patents. In 1996, <clears throat> he co-founded Geomechanics International, where he was the chairman of the board until 2008. He currently serves as a uh, <clears throat> senior executive advisor to Baker Hughes. Uh, Dr. Zoback has received numerous honors and awards including the 2006 Emil Weikert Medal of German Geophysics Society and the 2008 Walter Buscher Medal from the American Geophysical Society. In 2011, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and he recently served on the National Academy Energy uh, Committee investigating the Deepwater Horizon incident and the Secretary of Energy Committee on Shale Gas Development and Environmental Protection. So, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Zoback to give us his talk. Well, good morning, and it's a personal pleasure to be part of this tribute to, uh, to George Mitchell. Um, I've been working on shale gas a lot for about five years, so I'm kind of a newcomer to this, but um, it's a fascinating resource, and it means a lot, not only to the United States, uh, but to people um, around the world. I want to build on some of Dan Stewart's comments uh, and go through a, a number of issues. Uh, as has been pointed out, uh, this is a map from the Department of Energy. It's a, a remarkable resource throughout North America. The areas shown in red are principally the shale gas areas. Those shaded in green are uh, where oil is being produced uh, from these shales. Um, <clears throat> the numbers are a little bit smaller than uh, shown in the, uh, the map that uh, Dan showed from Halliburton, but nonetheless, we currently consume about 23 TCF per year of gas. Uh, the resource, recoverable resource, is on the order of 100 times that. So it's, it's, it's truly, uh, truly remarkable. Um, in the next 10 years, there are going to be many tens of thousands of wells, a million hydrofracks carried out. The scale of developing this resource is, is, is enormous. And so the challenge we have is how do we optimize that development? We're really at the beginning of this. We're just beginning. And how do we optimize the resource development and how do we minimize the environmental impact? And I want to make a couple of points about both of those challenges. Globally, uh, as was mentioned, uh, shale gas resources are, are uh, being discovered and sort of re-evaluated uh, constantly. Uh, this map came out um, last spring. Uh, again, it's from the Department of Energy, and no sooner was it out than major reassessments uh, of potential in, in England, Argentina, and eastern India were announced. So as large as these resources are, they keep getting bigger as uh, the feasibility of recovering gas from what had traditionally been thought of as impermeable source rocks uh, becomes a reality. I show this slide to frighten my students. I say that by 2050, when they're the age that I am now, which sort of sets in a little bit of shock, um, they will be expected to contribute to solving a tremendous problem, and that is that the, the growing world's population and increase of standard of living is going to demand more energy even with all the progress we're making with energy efficiency, of new energy systems, we will need about twice as much energy as we use today by mid-century. And that's a huge, huge challenge. So we think about the, the nexus of, of issues affecting ec the economics of energy development, uh, national security issues, the impact of different energy systems on the environment, 
And while we work on that, it's not a static problem. It's a problem which is of growing significance and is going to double in size uh, by mid-century. It's, it's an absolutely tremendous challenge, and uh, let's hope our uh, next generation is going to be um, up to it. This is kind of an old slide, uh, but makes uh, one point that uh, hasn't been made this morning, but I think many people are familiar with, and that is one of the advantages of natural gas is that as a fossil fuel, it is far more benign than other uh, fossil fuels, especially with respect to, say, using coal for electrical power generation. Natural gas produces about half as much CO2, much less of the SOx and NOx, none of the mercury, and none of the particulates. It is, it is you know, the perfect transition fuel to a decarbonized energy future. We want to go to a decarbonized energy future. It's going to take half a century to get there, and natural gas is the fuel to help accomplish that. The economics of uh, natural gas look quite good. This is a complicated slide. I, it's from the uh, report America's Energy Future, published by the National Academy in 2009. And I just want to point out that at its $6 an MCF, that is twice the current price, natural gas is cheaper than coal for making electricity. So it's not only a cleaner fuel, an abundant fuel, it's a cheaper fuel. If you include the cost of carbon capture and storage, it's even more pronounced because you're producing half as much carbon uh, to begin with. So natural gas has a lot going for it, and we now have an abundant supply of natural gas and a viable alternative to coal, which produces you know, half of our electricity and 40% of our CO2. Now, this high cost of uh, continuing to use coal and capturing the carbon and sequestering the carbon, uh, that's never going to happen. And there's a number of reasons for this. One reason is that it would require a $2 trillion subsidy by American taxpayers uh, by mid-century to accomplish it. More importantly, it's not going to happen because it's impossible. There's no place to put the carbon um, in the subsurface. And I'll make that point uh, again at the end of my talk. Now, uh, Dan's laid out the fundamentals that drove the success of the Barnett horizontal drilling, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, and these little uh, tick marks here are meant to indicate those micro-seismic events that are stimulating the permeability of the shale and allowing the gas to flow. So we, we, we kind of know the basics, and we know why the horizontal drilling and the repeated slick water fracking, actually it starts at the toe of the well and proceeds back toward the heel, um, has been so successful. And at the, the peak of activity in 2007 and early 2008 when prices were high, 3,000 wells per year were being drilled and completed with variants of this basic technology in, in the Fort Worth Basin alone. And yet despite that, when asked at a meeting of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, this was a meeting up in Arlington, this was the group of engineers actually carrying out this job, you know, they are confident in understanding reservoir drainage. 80% said no. They were confident in estimating the ultimate recovery. 80% said no. I think new completion technology is needed. 85% said yes, and so on. So despite being caught up in this land rush and attempting to exploit the Barnett Shale as rapidly as possible, prices were high, horizontal drilling, slick water fracking were working, in their hearts, they answered honestly. They were doing what they knew how to do, but they also knew there was a lot of room for improvement, and they would like to see those improvements to guide future development. This is my research group. Uh, as I said, we've been working hard on these problems uh, for the last five years, and all I want to say is they are as smart as they are good looking. And I briefly want to talk about um, how rock properties affect the success of stimulation. Uh, Dan introduced that topic. I want to talk about aseismic deformation mechanisms very briefly. In other words, we do this hydraulic fracturing, we get these micro-earthquakes, but there's more going on inside the reservoir. And, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the other factors affecting uh, the total recovery, and I especially want to talk about minimizing the environmental impact of shale gas development. 
This is a data set from the Barnett that was provided to us by ConocoPhillips. Five horizontal wells, each about 5,000 feet long, about 500 feet apart. Each well was hydrofracked 10 times in almost exactly the same way. So the reservoir over this area here was stimulated almost identically. And yet what you can see is that there's lots of micro earthquakes in some places and almost none in others. And we don't know why this is. Would it have been better to drill fewer wells, carried out fewer hydrofracks, done different things in different places? And it's all somehow related to the rock properties, the formation properties, and we need to figure this out in order not to waste a lot of time and money drilling unnecessary wells and unnecessary hydraulic fractures. One colleague has told me that they think that you know, 90% of the hydrocarbons come from about one-third of, of, uh, of the fracks. Now, we've been working with shale samples from all, all over, Barnett, Haynesville, uh, Canada, the Eagleford you've, you've heard about, and, and, a, and a few other places. I don't want to talk about you know, the details, of course. It's not the time or place. But one of the interesting mechanical aspects of these rocks is their viscoplastic. They deform slowly with time. And that property is very much related to how much clay is in the rock. The clay is what makes the rock so impermeable and hard to get the gas out, and it has a very dramatic effect on its physical properties. And in this particular example, we're watching how the sample deforms through time under a constant load. And when there are relatively small amounts of clay, that's a small process. But when we look at more clay-rich samples, the rock is flowing a lot, and the flowing of the rock relaxes the stresses and makes it harder to carry out the hydraulic fractures, harder to make the micro earthquakes, and harder to develop the gas. And we've got to be smarter about this, recognize that these variations in rock properties are critical, and, and do what's right as the formations dictate. In fact, um, this play right here, the Floyd Shale, is a place where uh, companies tried to produce gas uh, the Floyd had all the right attributes. It had the organic material, the right maturity, the right porosity. It was at a reasonable depth and temperature, but they never could produce a successful well. And one of the theories is it's because how much clay is in this, uh, in the Floyd shale. It's on the order of 50 to 60 percent, and it's just much too viscoplastic to be exploited in the conventional way. Now. The microearthquakes are produced by the fluid leaking into the rock, into small fractures, and triggering slip on pre-existing faults. And those little dots uh, that you see in these diagrams indicate where those events are located. Um, last summer, a student and I published and uh, were preparing uh, a new paper uh, making the case that the great majority of deformation that's going on inside the reservoir is actually the very slow slip on faults. There's much more happening than the little micro earthquakes indicate. In fact, you can do a very simple mass balance calculation. If you take each of those micro earthquakes, they're about magnitude minus two in size. A magnitude minus two earthquake releases as much energy as a gallon of milk hitting the floor uh, when it falls off the kitchen counter. It's not very much energy. It's a fault on the order of a, a meter, actually slightly less than a meter, that slips a tenth of a millimeter. These are very, very minor events. Now, if you think about the damage to the rock produced by each of those events, and you s argue that you're going to scavenge and produce all the gas covered, uh, caused by those micro earthquakes, add it all up you get less than 1% of the gas that's produced in the first six months. So there's got to be something else going on, and we're arguing that there's slow slip on faults going on as well as these little microseismic events, and that's, that's being absolutely critical. And we have to understand that better, and then we have to exploit that physical process more efficiently to optimize production. Another mystery is why these gas wells produce for so long. That's a good mystery, uh, but it's still a mystery. These are data uh, analyzed by Peter Valko and John Lee from Texas A&M University. And they did something clever, because on a well-to-well -well basis, the production histories are very variable. So they took all the wells drilled in July of 2004 and looked at the average monthly production per well. And you can see where it is here and how it declines. 
In 2005, the average monthly production for wells drilled in the Barnett increased substantially. This is industry getting smarter and declined after that. And in 2006, the wells drilled in July were still producing more and then, and then declined. Now, the decline of these wells can be modeled using traditional petroleum engineering techniques for the first couple of years. Everything is sort of depleting as a conventional reservoir would be expected to deplete. But what um, Valko and Lee pointed out is that this flattening of the production and what looks like persistent production at a low rate um, is going on for a very long period of time. Something else is going on. It's not a conventional reservoir in which you're just emptying out the porosity. Now, if we look at the Eagleford in this case, and as Dan pointed out, it's, it's more porous and permeable. If you look at an SEM photograph, that little black blob, the bedding is like this, and that's organic material, kerogen, the waxy organic substance from which the hydrocarbon is derived. If you zoom in, you can see it a little bit better, and if you zoom in all the way, you can see the pores inside the kerogen that are the initial pathways for the gas to come out of the rock. These are slightly bigger uh, than the ones that Dan showed. These are on the order of a few tens of nanometers across. But the really interesting thing is that at this scale, we no longer have Darcy flow. In other words, flow to a, due to an imposed pressure gradient. So the flow regime is different. In fact, when you get down to, say, 10 nanometers, the equation of state for the gas is even changing because of the interaction between the gas and the pore walls. Uh, this is a slide from Carl Sondergeld at the University of Oklahoma. There's a lot on the slide, but Carl's point, which is a point I agree with, is that as we go from flow in sort of the larger conduits, and it's kind of the flow we understand, and move to the flow from the smaller and smaller conduits, different physical and chemical processes start to become important, such as Newton diffusion, desorption processes, and so on. And so in the early days, we're probably emptying out the easy porosity, the bigger pore spaces. And in later days, what's probably happening is we're seeing a shift in the flow mechanisms, and we're beginning to see diffusion and desorption contributing appreciably to the gas production. So the, the big question now is how long will this relatively constant production persist? And uh, for reasons which are rather obvious, the uh, leaders of a number of major independent gas companies are arguing these wells are going to last 25 or 30 years. There's a lot of gas to come out, even at these low rates, over 25 to 30 years. And that may be a reasonable um, prediction. We just don't know. And we need to understand this better. Of course, over the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to find out. But the more we can do to understand the mechanisms of what are going on, the better our predictions can be today of what the ultimate recovery is going to be. Now, we're all very aware uh, of the pushback uh, to shale gas development because of a number of environmental issues, some real and some imagined. But the issues have been raised, and that's, and that's real enough. This has to do with the surface contamination due to uh, drilling and uh, associated activities, the potential uh, for gas leakage from the wells, I issues associated with the disposal of flowback waters. After you do the hydro hydraulic fracturing, you flow the water back. You usually get about 25 percent. It's variable from place to place. 25 uh, percent of the injected water comes back, and you have to dispose of it. Um, whether or not the question of whether or not hydraulic fracturing can affect wells has been raised repeatedly. We're now seeing earthquakes triggered with the uh, injection of flowback water, and there's a big impact on residents and uh, the effect of land. You know, it takes a lot of, it's a, a big impact to drill a well. Tens of thousands of wells um, is a very significant impact. And all of these problems get wrapped up into a bumper sticker called no fracking. I hate the word fracking. First of all, it doesn't have a K, but you know, that's another. But the problem is, is if we misidentify the problem, we misidentify the solution. And there are real problems, and those problems have solutions. And just saying no fracking is just sort of, you know, a simplistic approach. It's simplified what's going, going on 
to uh, almost the point of absurdity. And we, we just have to get past that. We have to look at the problems, and we have to look at the solutions. And let's talk about that in the context of this um, DOE committee that um, Steve Holditch mentioned a few years ago, a few minutes ago. Um, we issued two 90-day reports. The first was in August, and the, uh, and the, the second in, in November. Um, the committee was chaired by John Deutsch. I had the pleasure of serving with Steve on this committee and a number of others. And the, one of the interesting things about the committee is that it was small and it was very diverse. Um, Fred Krupp is the president of the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Dan Jurgen, everyone knows as a, as a well-known energy analyst. And this very diverse group came together and agreed that to the following. Oh, well, let me, excuse me let, me, let me show you the charge first uh, from the president via the, the Secretary of Energy. To develop within six months consensus recommended advice to the agencies on practices for shale gas extraction to ensure the protection of public health and the environment. In other words, the president and the secretary sort of finally got it. It was 2011, early 2011, but they finally understood that this was for real, this was important, and if it was going to be utilized, it had to be utilized while protecting the environment and protecting the public. Our committee um, agreed about a lot. The high order uh, issues is first the importance of the resource. Uh, Steve's already mentioned it's 30% of all of our natural gas production and, and climbing. Uh, the, the development has large positive economic impacts, both in revenues to the states, uh, jobs, and so on. But most importantly, that this very critical resource can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. And we made 20 recommendations to improve best practice and regulatory practice to, to accomplish that. And I want to talk just about a few, a few of these. And protection of water quality is the issue I'm going to focus on. And the first thing I want to say is that we urged adoption of systems of disclosure of the flow and composition of the waters used for drilling, fracturing, the flowback water, and, and, and the fate of those waters uh, through the entire process. And we said, disclose it, put it on publicly available websites, and remove the mystery and the paranoia. There's really nothing to worry about. Um, you know, this is an industrial process. An industrial process involves chemicals, and chemicals are used safely every day through in all sorts of industries. And a lot of the fear of fracking is, is um, driven by the public sort of not knowing what is being done. So let's tell them. Another issue, of course, concerns the hydraulic fracturing process itself and the question of whether horizontal, the, the hydraulic fractures uh, carried out repeatedly in the horizontal wells will sort of grow up from the depths of the shale and start affecting water supplies. And the answer to that question is very clear, very simple, and that is, it is no. It will not in nearly all of the active shale gas plays. And the reason for that is the depth of the shales. Now, if in fact we're producing from very shallow depths, what I'm about to say is not relevant, and extreme care must be taken. But in nearly all of the plays we've been talking about, these shales are at depths at five to 9,000 feet, and we know that the fractures do not grow vertically. This is a, a, a slide put together by uh, Kevin Fisher and expanded upon by Norm Warpinski of Pinnacle. Uh, basically, what they're showing in the red line is the depth of the Barnett Shale. So they've just taken all of the wells, over 2,000 wells that were studied here, and they just order them, the shallowest well and the deepest well. So uh, the, you know, the depth is going from something like 5,000 feet to something like 9,000 feet. Now, the microseismic monitoring is showing you where the fluid is going. And so this spiky signal that you see here is the connecting the dots between the shallowest and the deepest microearthquakes. Along the top are the depth of wells producing fresh water in the area. 
And as you can see that while um, some of the hydrofracks do grow vertically, each line there is 1,000 feet, um, they are many, many, many thousands of feet away from the water supplies. And there has never been a single instance in which hydraulic fracturing has shown to directly contaminate a water supply. The big problem in the Barnett is when the fractures grow down into the Ellenberger and you turn a gas well into a salt water well, which is, of course, not a, not, not a good thing. In the Marcellus, there are fewer wells, but the story is much the same. The depth of the water wells, the depth of the Marcellus, the variation in the height uh, at which the hydrofracs grow. Again, there's almost no downward propagation of the fracs, but they do propagate. In fact, sometimes as much as 2,000 feet above the shale, they are nowhere near the water supplies. But in fact, three quarters of these wells are showing substantial frac growth vertically, which is just a waste of time, a waste of money, and a waste of energy. And we like to do this better so that, you know, that this wasn't happening, but it's not an environmental problem. The third issue concerning water quality is to adopt best practices in well development construct and well construction, especially how the wells are cased and cemented. Now this is very mundane, but it's very important. This is a, a figure taken from a, a paper by George King. George King works for the Apache Corporation, and he's done thousands of frac jobs. And his point is that when we look at the local geology, we have choices. We have choices about how we case and cement and construct the wells. And in this case, and these are real examples, uh, surface casing was set to 500 feet and cemented to protect the aquifers. Now, a second string of casing was set uh, much deeper, and then the final string was the production string in the horizontal section of the well. But when the second string was cemented, it only came up, the cement came up here, so that mine, there was nothing behind the casing uh, for, to protect the gas coming from minor gas producing shales, a saline aquifer, and a coal seam. So that there's only a single barrier to leakage, and that's that cement right there. Okay, that's not a very good system if these wells are going to last for 30 years. And George points out that a much better system to uh, have used would be to put a secondary string of casing in and cement it all the way, and now you've got secondary barriers uh, to flow. Very simple, very mundane, but very important. In fact, when our committee was visiting uh, an operation of range resources in Washington County, Pennsylvania, they were very proud of the fact that they had taken a conservative approach and use multiple casings to, to case off these intermediate gas producing zones and create multi barriers to leakage. The point is a poorly constructed well could potentially leak over time whether it's hydraulically fractured or not. And so there are three keys to preventing leakage and possible contamination. Well construction, well construction, and well construction. If you do this right, it pays off for decades and prevents all sorts of problems. And best practice and regulation must reflect the local geologic conditions. And this is one reason industry rightly argues that the best way to regulate this drilling is by the states where they can adapt the practice to local conditions. Now, two other things we pointed out that haven't received enough, enough attention yet. One is that we need to manage the cumulative impacts on communities, land use, wildlife, and ecosystems. We can't just permit wells or a group of wells or a single pipeline, we have to look at the whole development and plan it properly to minimize its cumulative impact. And second is we're not very well organized to do that right now. We, we, you know, we have environmental groups yelling on one side of the room and we have industry yelling on the other side of the room, but what we need to do is, is sort of organize, work together and come up with you know, best practices appropriate for the area and, and to, to minimize this impact and let development proceed. Now, a very hot topic in the last couple of years have been earthquakes triggered by fluid injection. Uh, on, New, on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, there were earthquakes in Ohio. Uh, last spring, earthquakes in Arkansas. There have been an increase in seismicity almost throughout the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport had earthquakes in 2009. Now, this seems very mysterious. The public is very concerned. Um, 
but we understand the physics of faulting. Now, we can't predict earthquakes. That, we're not talking about predicting an earthquake in sort of time, place, and magnitude, but what we are talking about is understanding whether the conditions exist under which injection might trigger an earthquake. And this is a, a cartoon from my book. Um, I just want to illustrate strike-slip faulting when two blocks of rock slide parallel to each other. The expected fault is at an angle of about 30 degrees to the direction of the maximum stress in the earth. Um, we know this well. We've tested these theories in the lab and in the field. We know they're applicable. And when we look at the Arkansas earthquakes, for example, this is the, the earthquakes that occurred last spring. They were right next to an injection well. The earthquakes spread out on a fault. Um, we know the orientation of the stresses extremely well because this is just to the west of the, the New Madrid seismic zone in the central U.S. Three giant earthquakes occurred here in 1811, 1812. We're very interested in the seismic hazard, the mechanics of what's going on. And when we look at these triggered earthquakes, we see that they're occurring on a fault with just the right orientation with respect to the regional stresses. So it was no surprise that this happened. In fact, when you look at seismicity, this is an earthquake map from the U.S. Geological S Survey for the um, eastern United States. This is India and China, Southeast Asia. You see earthquakes almost everywhere. And in fact, much of my career in the early days was sort of establishing this idea that the Earth's crust is critically stressed. These red dots, here we are in the Canadian Shield, billions of years old, extremely stable, and yet when reservoirs are impounded, you build a dam, you impound a reservoir, you get small earthquakes. A very small perturbation caused the earthquake. Western China is far more seismically active than Eastern China or India, but all these red dots indicate places where uh, small perturbations of pore pressure have triggered earthquakes. While eastern China is relatively aseismic, some of the biggest and most devastating earthquakes in history have in fact occurred in eastern China. So the rate at which the crust is deforming is very low here. The crust is old, strong, it's deforming slowly, but the stresses are high and you can trigger earthquakes. As we look at the United States, the red colors here represent more compressive stresses, the uh, intermediate colors less compressive stresses, the blue colors the least compressive stresses. As we, as we look at, at what's happening, we see these regional variations. They actually have a first order effect on how the shale gas is, is developed. In fact, in the Barnett, the horizontals tend to be shorter, the stresses are higher, and the wells are more unstable. It also means that you're going to activate different faults when you pressurize them. But it's all, you know, it's working in the context of things we know and things we can understand if we go about the development in a, in a, in a logical way. So let me tell you how to manage this problem. That's in the newspapers repeatedly. I, I've been invited to Youngstown, Ohio on Tuesday uh, to, at a public hearing on, on triggered earthquakes. Fortunately, I have to teach on Tuesday. I can't make it. But um, in fact, first I got a call from the, the state senate majority leader, and I was, I was actually on vacation and didn't answer the call, and then the state minority leader, who's a Stanford alum, called me. So, uh, the, you know, there's tremendous public interest. The legislators don't know what to do. The regulators don't know what to do. But we know what to do because we understand the process. You have to avoid injection into potentially active faults, number one. We have to limit the injection rates and pressures, right? If the rock's impermeable, you're going to have to pump really hard, and that's not good, okay? We have to monitor seismicity when we think there's a potential problem, and we have to be prepared to abandon some injection wells. This is not the end of the world, okay? There are 50,000 licensed injection wells in the state of Texas. This is a large-scale industrial process. We just need to do a little bit more, and we, get, we need to be out in front of this instead of always playing catch-up. Something bad happens. First we deny it, and then we try to, you know, um, clean up after it, and it's always too late because we've lost the confidence of the public. So last July, uh, Time Magazine uh, had this cover with uh, shale on the cover. This rock could power the world. And then in small print, it said the you know, resource is enormous, but hey, there are these environmental problems. Basically, uh, Time had it just right, except I think this rock will power the world. 
but we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. If no one's going to ask a question, I will. Uh, what do you think of the Cornell study about all of the air pollution that comes from the flowback water? Yeah. Um, the, the study, I was asked about a, a Cornell study on uh, air pollution. Um, methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So if we are um, accidentally releasing methane into the atmosphere, during the gas development proce process, whether during the flow back after a hydrofrac or just through uh, leakage in the transportation and distribution system, we're actually having a negative effect even though the fuel is fundamentally cleaner. Cornell published a study saying that, in fact, um, these methane, uh, these fugitive emissions, as they're called, were so severe that, in fact, gas development was would have more greenhouse war warming potential and have a, a a negative effect on the atmosphere compared to business as usual. Um, it's a real issue. Unfortunately, they wound up making up numbers on fugitive emissions to make their case. And that, that study has been refuted by other universities, the Department of Energy, and various industry groups. So it's a, it's a real issue. It's an issue that has to be looked at. The analysis that was uh, done by Cornell is simply not re reliable because they were just plugging in numbers uh, to make the point that they didn't want shale gas development in the, you know, in Western New York, but in in fact, um, there, there's not much credibility in the result. The issue is a credible issue that needs to be addressed, and we need to to pay more attention to. Mark, uh, over here. <laughs> uh, could you elaborate a little bit on your earlier comment about the uh, carbon sequestration possibilities? Oh, okay. Um, my concern is that if injecting these relatively small volumes in a few, you know, injection wells are triggering earthquakes uh, all over the place, um, the huge volumes that have to be injected associated with, uh, you know, capturing and uh, sequestering uh, CO2 from uh, coal burning power plants would have a far greater effect. Now, the, a magnitude 4 earthquake which is not very big, you know, as an earthquake which would be widely felt, incapable of causing any damage. A magnitude 4 earthquake caused by injecting flowback water is a nuisance. And, a, you know, people are concerned and we don't want it to happen. But a magnitude 4 earthquake in a CO2 repository is a showstopper because it represents slip on a fault a couple kilometers in size and a few centimeters of slip. So you basically create a permeable pathway to the surface by triggering an earthquake of you know, little significance. So it's a very asymmetric situation. In one case, you, you need to stop injecting, and the problem goes away. In another place, uh, the other case, you've created a pathway for the CO2 you've been injecting to escape to the surface. And so um, there's simply no place to put it in the volumes necessary, it being the CO2, in the volumes necessary uh, you know, to actually have a beneficial effect on, on climate change. Uh, what has been the largest earthquake that's been identified with fluid injection? And uh, if you live in California, you get used to 4.0 earthquakes. I really don't do much damage. Uh, trucks going down the street cause earthquakes, basically. Right. Um, the biggest earthquake that has been clearly associated with injection that, that I'm aware of is the four point, magnitude 4.7 that occurred in Arkansas last spring. Now, a larger earthquake, a 5.3, I believe, occurred in Oklahoma, and there was a lot of speculation about whether or not that might have been triggered by injection. I think we don't know. It was a deep earthquake, you know, separated by the, um, um, you know, from the injection wells by uh, several kilometers, and, and you know, that, that's going to, I think, a lot more study needs to be done whether we know there was an injection there. So it's on the order of 4.7. Um, so widely felt, but not causing damage but the public is still, still concerned. The important thing to remember is you only get big earthquakes on big faults. 
And we can, you know, as geophysicists, we can locate these faults with seismic techniques and other techniques. We can avoid them. Now, smaller faults are harder to find, and you might miss those, and that's why you want to monitor seismicity. And if you start getting um, some small earthquakes, you, you might want to stop. What I've argued is that operators should, you know, develop a protocol with regulators. And they say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to monitor it. And if this happens, this is what we'll do. And, you know, if it doesn't, and, and it's all done. Uh, ahead of time, and then you, you have a context for, for carrying out your operations and responding to things which, which occur that might be unexpected. Um, and it's, it's, it's no longer news. So um, that's what I mean by sort of getting out in front of this and instead of sort of waiting uh, for something bad to happen and then just try, you know, try to catch up and tell the public, well, you know, don't worry. That, that, that never works. Yeah. On the, uh, on the issue of standards, uh, what do you think, where do you think the industry rates right now overall and how it's adopting the, you know, the optimal standards? And number two, you know, what do you think is that equilibrium where, as you say, there'll be no news where, you know, what is a point of comf comfortable point where standards are, you know, used by industry and to the point where everybody, you know, overall feels secure? What does that picture look like? Um, by the way, it really is hard to hear up here. Uh, um, you know, it's an, it, it's an evolution. Um, it was, it's an evolution of technology, you know, as we learn more. And I think, I think the, the regulatory process will evolve as well as we, you know, solve some problems and recognize, and recognize other problems. So one thing our committee, um, you know, focused on was this how to set up a, a mechanism for constant improvement. And this is where this, um, you know, organizing for best practice comes in. So that you get the, the operators, the regulators, the public interest groups in the same place. You talk about what should be done based on local conditions. And then as things proceed, as, you know, new problems arise, the groups working together decide how to modify things. So it, it, there's never an equilibrium. You're always improving the technology, and you should always be improving the environmental protection. And, but right now, there's, there's no dialogue. It's just people yelling at each other, and the, and the regulators trying to figure out what to do. And so, uh, uh, you know, if we did that, I think we'd take a giant step forward to bringing the public around and making them part of the process instead of feeling like they're victimized by what others are doing.